Praise the Lord. No, uh, there's just there's a lot going on. Um, I don't know. You got these allergies, and, you know, this cold, and like snot's falling out of the room everywhere. It's glorious. I'm tired. I'm tired of like bad weather in the winter and you know cold. Yes. And just, you know, yeah. you know. You ever, you ever have that kind of cloud that spirit sort of settle into your life? It's like you just oh. You wake up and like oh. And you know you walk in. Some people try to say good morning to you. You're like oh, you quiet. <laughs> some of you've been doing this for years. Like what are you talking about? Like, you're not as bumpy or as July. <laughs> you know, but there's other things. Um, this is a, a special weekend for us. Uh, my firstborn son is registered for university. Isn't that crazy? That's great. Uh, yeah. Some of you have been through this before, but it's my turn to talk about it. Uh, you had your chance. Uh, so I'm, we're sitting in in this in this uh, auditorium, and the uh, president of the university is coming to address all of the incoming new students that are there to register for the classes. And there's this excitement in the air, sort of nervous energy. That was just probably me, uh, or my wife, more like my wife. <laughs> yeah, she would have, He just came up and said. Good morning, you students. And my wife's like, oh, my God, you're so little. I don't know what's happening. I'm just being a fellow. Like, honey, just say hello. <laughs> She's going to be God. I just know. It's a thing to grow up in. No, it's my baby. No, uh, it wasn't like that. Sort of. Um, but yeah, no, he's, he's addressing me. He's talking about, you know, all the things that they can look forward to and, you know, this stage in their life. And uh, those of you adults that have uh, gone through this, you remember what it was like being a, being a young adult and you're looking at all these decisions and this new independence and uh, there's this excitement and there's nervousness and anxiety and this eagerness to, to get in there and be part of that. We're walking around the campus and we're envisioning, you know, all of the of things. I'll tell you what I'm thinking is, I'm like, looking at the other parents, I'm like, how did they get so old? <laughs> you know what I mean? Because, like, I, I don't look like that. You know what I mean? It's like, I'm a lot, you know, I'm, I was surprised that it confused me for one of the students. <laughs> I mean, I thought, and then you realize how delusional you are. They go, you look exactly like these other parents. That's exactly how old you are. Get over yourself. I don't know, life is fascinating, isn't it? I mean, I am so grateful for this church that um, I have, not make it emotional, it's cold. I'm thankful that God brought us here. I'm thankful that God brought you guys here. In this city, in this town, in this time, we've had some difficult times, but uh, there is nothing like having a church family uh, that, that we get to go through life together. Um, and we've had some things to celebrate. Uh, I love when we get to celebrate birthdays and anniversaries and accomplishments and achievements. And we've had some times when we've had to hit our knees and pray for each other pretty desperately. I'm thinking about Renee right now. You guys know Renee, she's in the hospital. Uh, she had surgery, in fact, she's had pain, so much pain. She, she, she can hardly stand up here and sing when she gets a chance to just because of the pain. There's some Sunday mornings where she, I'll get a text right before church and say to the pastor, I'm so sorry, I just can't make it today. So the pain is just too bad. And, uh, you know, we're praying desperately that God would help use this procedure to help her get some relief. And, uh, but, you know, it's not just her. I, I look across our congregation and I can see so many people who have asked for prayer, who have come to their church family, brothers and sisters, and said, I need prayer. I, there is something that's happening in my life that, that if God doesn't move or act or intervene, that I'm in trouble. 
And every single time, we have stepped up to the plate and said, I will pray. I will pray right now. We will take you before the Lord, and we will gather together. I may not be able to fix it, but I'll make you some biscuits. <laughs> or like a lasagna or something. <laughs> well, we help, and we care for one another. And I don't know, I had somebody ask me, where do you see your church in five years? And I just said, I don't know, maybe be in a church. I've always thought that was one of the coolest things that we could become is an actual body of believers that care for one another and care for the lost people of the world. And that we pray for each other, we support each other. We're, you don't have to look very deep to realize that we don't have it all together. As individuals or collectively. But we have love. That love doesn't come from just a simple act of our own will because other people are nice to us. The love that we have in our hearts comes from the love that we've experienced from Jesus Christ first. You cannot love someone genuinely unless you've experienced the genuine love of Jesus Christ. And you, you can say, well, that's how, how do people who are Christians love each other? There's all, let's name it something else. I'll tell you this, if you don't have a genuine concern for the well-being of someone that goes beyond just what this life might hand them and goes to what happens in eternity, how can you truly and genuinely love somebody without considering what happens to them forever? And so we love each other because Jesus loved us first. I'll tell you what, it's easy to love people who love you back. It's easy, it's easy to love people who are nice to you and kind to you and who are, are, are considerate and giving and caring and, and, uh, and good looking and smell nice and all that stuff. It's easy to love those people. You have to. I'm thankful for those people, the easy loving people. You're welcome. <laughs> Some pastors just give sermons, we have dialogue. <laughs> I am, but you know what? Uh, if you're if you're part of a real church for long enough, one of the things you realize is there are some people who are hard to love. <laughs> if you're part of life very long, well, you realize there are people who are hard to love. They will actually try to stop you from loving them. They will put up, they will sabotage your efforts to love them, and they will actually make it as difficult as possible. And there's all kinds of psychology behind that, reasons for that, and spiritual causes for that. But God has called us to love those who are unlovable. The greatest witness and testimony of your faith in Jesus Christ is when you are able to accomplish the calling of loving somebody who doesn't deserve it. Do you hear me? Because I'm thankful for a God who doesn't give us what we deserve. Because if He started handing out what people deserve, I'm in trouble, guys. I'm in big trouble. And so when your your love for other people starts <laughs> to depend upon the factor of how much they deserve or qualify for it, you have not experienced the true love of Jesus Christ. Because Jesus loves us unconditionally. While we were yet sinners, he died for us. That means when we didn't deserve it, we can't earn it, we can't repay it. He gave it to us freely, abundantly, never ending, unconditionally. He loves us. And he calls us to experiment with loving other people that same way. And that's what he's doing. I've been part of church my whole life. I don't even remember a time. I hate to admit that I haven't always enjoyed it. There's, there's, because there's people in church. Did you know this? <laughs> I don't know if you did this. Um, and sometimes they will disappoint you. They will let you down. They will frustrate you. They will aggravate you. They will, they will, sometimes they're mean. Do you know church people can be mean? Just some of the meanest people I've known. Praise the Lord. And then they'll just give you right inside. And they'll just give But then we're people, and they don't always mean to, but sometimes we can be hurtful to one another, right? We don't always intend to, uh, but 
hopefully you don't intend to, but sometimes we can hurt each other, and church people do it because we're people. Um, I, and so I confess I've not always enjoyed being part of church or a church. But I, I'm, I'm working on it. I, I wonder what it would look like if we could actually be part of something that was the kind of church that we've always wanted to be part of. I wonder if we could contribute to getting us in that direction in some way, either by our prayers or by our involvement or just by our encouragement to one another. If we could be part of a church that was the way that it's described in Scripture, where we're all part of one body, each one of us different members, different parts of this body, working together, not looking down on each other, but united with Jesus Christ as the head of this body. That's the picture that, that Paul paints for us, and that's the picture that the Bible gives us of what the church is supposed to be like. One body functioning together with different roles and responsibilities and gifts and all have meaning and purpose and belong to something. What if, what if we could do that? You think, I know, we're just this little church in Marysville, how could we possibly become the church that God wants us to be. Well, if not here, why, why wouldn't he? Why would God put us here? Why would God create this opportunity for us if he didn't want to see us through to becoming what he created us? So here we are. We're, we're here in this place, in this world at this time to be the church that God's called us to be in Marysville, in this city, in this community. How are we going to do that? So I want, I want you to open your Bibles to Genesis. Just give me a few minutes here this morning. Because <coughs> I want to unpack this a little bit. I want to connect the Old Testament and New Testament just a, just a touch. Genesis chapter 11 is where I want to start. Uh, but I want to bring us into the book of Acts in a minute. If you're familiar with the story of Genesis as it unfolds, there is this strange and sort of magical story that happens in Genesis chapter 11. It's a story about the Tower of Babel, all right? So if you get the scene here as you're scanning through that scripture, the whole world had one language, and okay? that's everybody. There wasn't these, these different languages, and a common speech. As men moved eastward, found the plain of Shinar, settled there. They said to each other, come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They used brick instead of stone and tar for work. It says, come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that they may make a name, so we may make a name for ourselves and not be scattered over the face of the whole earth. Okay, so uh, here's, the, there's a lot of gaps in this conversation that we're not really given. We're just given kind of the, the thought process, the motives behind this. You kind of have this group of people that are kind of uh, just not really defined when they're moving, and they decide they want to settle here, they want to create their own civilization, and they want to build some monuments to, <coughs> to this effect. For their fame, and their glory, whatever their motives, we don't have the whole story. I'm assuming there's other conversations that took place, but they're making bricks are more than they're building stuff. And it's going really well. They're all speaking the same language. But here's where it gets twisted. Verse 5, the Lord came down to see the city and the tower that the men were building. The Lord said, if, this is important, if as one people speaking the same language, they have begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for Come, let us go down and confuse their language so that they will not understand each other. So the Lord scattered them from there over all the earth, and they stopped building the city. That is why it is called Babylon, because there the Lord confused the language of the whole world. From there the Lord scattered them over the face of the whole earth. Okay, so what I know about human nature is that we tend to settle. That there is a, a 
And maybe that's not true for everyone, but I, I think in general, the human nature is to want to set up our civilization, to set up our process and system and monuments and structure and technology. We want to make our mark. We want to define our borders. We want to kind of have our spot, our place, our identity. There is something about human nature that we are driven to want to settle. And this seems to be like what's happening in humanity at this point, is that even though they're all speaking one language, they, they identify this one place, and we're going to settle right here, we're going to build towers. Why did God come down and decide to break this whole little party up? It doesn't really tell us. How's that? I don't really explain it. So we can we have to try to infer some things, right? Apparently, the observation that the Lord has upon this situation is that if these people all speaking the one one language and being unified can do this, what does he say? Nothing would be impossible for them. So the Lord Himself recognizes the potential in a group of people who are united, speaking the same language, to build and accomplish something that's never been done, or anything that could be done. So what does God do? Now you, my personal opinion on this, I, I think God, is, his intention was to populate the earth I think his intention was to diversify the civilization. And so he comes down and he says, no, you're not going to settle here and just build your own little community where you've got everything you need and want and you're just going to hide out here. I have a bigger plan and purpose for this creation. So he, he divides the languages and people begin to civilize or, or begin to um, go out into the rest of the world and populate the world based upon their languages and their connections and things like that. Um, so fast forward, fast forward to the book of Acts. Now if you're familiar with the story of the New Testament, you cannot understand really what happened at the day of Pentecost without understanding what happened in Genesis chapter 11. So the scenario is this, Jesus has, was God in human form, born as a baby in a stable in a manger, lives in this earth as a man and walks this earth and is tempted as all of us have been tempted, and he overcomes it. He is perfect, without spot or blemish. His ministry is full of miracles and confronting established religious order. He is opening eyes and both literally and spiritually, he is bringing forgiveness and freedom to people caught in sin and just suffering under the weight of the religious order of the day. And he is crucified. He, is, he dies on the cross. He is buried in the tomb. He is raised from the dead. He is revealed to the witnesses. And he ascends into heaven, leaving his disciples that remain with the commission to go into the world and to make other disciples. And he says this, that he provides this gift. And what is the gift? Do you know what it is? So that he was going to leave with us. Okay, the Holy Spirit, you got it. You guys got it. Now we're level 201. All right? <laughs> So I'm going to leave with you the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, right, to guide you. Now, you, you may ask, where's the Holy Spirit been this whole time? It's not like the Holy Spirit just was all of a sudden created and Jesus was like, here's this gift. The Holy Spirit's been around this whole time, involved in the whole process. But when Jesus ascends into heaven, the disciples are very concerned that Jesus is going to be gone. Now we have this, how are we going to accomplish what he has called us to do? And Jesus says, don't worry about it. I'm leaving you my Holy Spirit to actually reside in you to empower you to accomplish what I've called you to do. We cannot be and cannot do what God's called us to be and do without the power and the gift of the Holy Spirit. 
It is not an action of our brains or our willpower that is required. It is the Holy Spirit divine empowerment that we need more than anything. So well, how do you, how do you, is that like a, 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 an upgrade, like an operating system, like a download, you download it, is it an app? Kind of. So this is what happens. The disciples were still meeting in Jerusalem. You realize that's where, that's where Jesus had, had gone and taken them, and that's where he was crucified. And they're still kind of hanging out there. There is really no sense still cohesively of how they're going to accomplish. They don't really know where else to go, so they're still hanging out in the synagogue, right? And um, they have some people, some followers, and yes, they've seen Jesus. He ascended into heaven. He gave them this thing. We're supposed to have the Holy Spirit. But how does this work? And so they're praying, right? Go with me to Acts chapter 2. It's the day of Pentecost. <laughs> a Jewish holiday, by the way. They were all together in one place, and suddenly a sound like a blowing of a violent wind came from heaven, filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were, there were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. As they were there celebrating this festival. <coughs> when they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard them speaking in his own language. Utterly amazed, they asked, are not all these men who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each one of us hears them in his own native language? Parthia, Medes, Illinois, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Persia, Pamphylia. I don't know how to pronounce half these things. Egypt and parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Jesus, Christians and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongue. Amazed and perplexed, they ask one another, what does this mean? Okay, so. If God, upon seeing what was taking place at the Tower of Babel, was motivated to confuse the languages of men, separating them in all these different civilizations, now we have, through an act of the Holy Spirit, indwelling his disciples, manifesting itself in them speaking in languages that weren't just babbling. Okay, this wasn't just them running, running words out their mouth that didn't make sense. What was actually happening was that God had empowered them to speak in languages that other people could understand. And these people, as they came and witnessed them, were amazed and perplexed. How could these guys who have never, they didn't have Rosetta Stone, they didn't have any education in these other languages, all of a sudden, these people from all over the world came here to Jerusalem, and they could hear people speaking in their native language. And the only reason is because the Holy Spirit empowered them to do it. Jesus gave the gift. God provided the outpouring. And the result was the miraculous reversal of what took place at the Tower of Babylon where people's language was confused, and now people were united. Why? Because unlike now, what was being built was not an earthly kingdom, but an eternal, everlasting, spiritual kingdom based upon Jesus Christ. This was not just a group of people that were building a city to honor themselves and provide for their own safety and growth. This was now a heavenly kingdom that had come to earth to unify God's creation and to build his kingdom on earth, to have his will done here as it is in heaven through the power of the Holy Spirit. So what does this mean? It means some things are going to change. But some, however, made fun of them, said they'd had too much wine. So you guys know the story of 
of how this plays out. There were, they begin to preach. People hear the message of Jesus Christ. Some for the first time in their own language. They are converted. They, are, they become Christ followers. And they, they, they get baptized. And now all of a sudden, the church is exploding and growing exponentially. But it is still located in Jerusalem. So there is persecution that continues to take place. Why? Because God didn't want the, the kingdom of heaven to just reside in the city of Jerusalem. He wanted it to go out to all of the world, to the Gentiles and everyone. And so the persecution that happens in Jerusalem, some of the struggles that the early church has in Jerusalem, forces them to move out beyond those walls and the comfort of that city that they experienced up until that, that point. And taking with them the gospel message of Jesus Christ to all the world. So people often look at this, and I want you to, to explain what the church was like after this outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And so Acts chapter 2, verse 42, listen to this. This is what was going on. It says, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. All of the believers were together and had everything in common, selling their possessions and good. They gave to anyone as he had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God, enjoying the favor of all people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. So you get this picture of a church. The apostles were teaching people couldn't get enough of it. Man, it's like pulling teeth sometimes to get people to come to church to hear God's word. And yet you see in the early church, they couldn't, they, they were like, they were, they were so hungry for learning. And they were sharing together. Just look at the way they described their lives. They ate together. They, they, they hung out together. They spent time together. They, they, uh, they intertwined their faith and their life. Church wasn't just a place that they went. It was a community that they were part of. Right? They got involved in each other's lives. They, I know this sounds scary for you guys. Especially looking around this room. Like, I don't want you involved. <laughs> But they got, they got, they connected to one another. So many people today, they want to go to a church where they can just check in, sign in, check that off their list of things to do, go home and do all the things that have nothing to do with their church. Well, you see early on, the idea was that church was a belonging, the things that you were part of, a place that you connected with, the people. And miracles took place. Learning took place. They loved each other. They took care of each other. They shared what they had. So we're going to take another offering today. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. Uh, there's so much commentary just about this. So you probably heard this and wondered about this. But really, they sold everything. They brought it together. It's like weirdos. <laughs> and it is like, and I, it actually didn't work, by the way. The church in Jerusalem fell apart because, because people were using more than they were giving. You know, it sounds great. Let's all sell everything and share it. And then somebody like eats all the donuts and now we have no donuts. We can't go buy anymore. You know, so it's like it, it, it eventually kind of fell apart. On this, But this was what I want you to see is the spirit of community that was developed that is still relevant today when you care enough about someone else's needs that you're willing to sacrifice your own to try to help them. That's where Jesus is. You know what? We all have problems. We all have, man, we can, we can lay them out here. We all have needs. But when you care about somebody else's to put your own on the back burner for a minute to be able to reach out and help them, and I can tell you guys, I, I've had it happen to me from you guys. I've had people in this church share with me at the expense of their own well-being so that I could be blessed. And it's not comfortable. I would much rather be on the end where I'm helping someone else, right? 
it's not easy to receive a kindness from someone else. I've had it happen, and it's life-changing. I'm grateful. I can't wait until the opportunity that I get to do that for someone else. And there is something magical that happens when a group of people begin living that way. I can't wait for the next chance I get to bless someone else. I can't wait for the next opportunity that I get to come alongside someone who is discouraged and give them a little boost. When we start living that way, it will revolutionize the church. Because that's the spirit of Jesus. And that's the Holy Spirit. I made this up. I'm just going to tell you straight. I made it up. I don't know why I made it up. I was thinking of the word church, the one is church. And I'm like, church has all these letters, C-H-U-R-C-H. And I thought, you know what, I'm going to come up with words that go along with each one of those letters. And I'm going to share it. I'm going to do that now. <laughs> what is the church? First of all, it's Christ-centered. Otherwise, we're just a club. Or we're just some organization. This is and always and ever has been and must always be about Jesus Christ. If people don't know who Community West of the Church is, it doesn't make a difference. If people don't know who Brent Askins is, it doesn't make a difference. If nobody knows who you are, it doesn't make a difference. But if people don't know who Jesus Christ is, it makes a big difference. We live and exist. Our purpose as a church is to glorify the name and the person of Jesus Christ. It's always about Him. So if you feel yourself getting into the left, into the center line, if you feel yourself being feeling slighted, or like you know people don't you know talk to you enough, or or there's not enough programs for you, let me just remind you: it always has been, always will be about Jesus Christ, and your needs are somewhere down below that. You are not the center of the universe. Jesus Christ is the most important in all, all the world. He's the greatest treasure. And so if we're going to be a church, it has to be Christ-centered. So then there's an H. And I thought, listen, i got to be careful because there's another H later, so I don't want to use like the best H. It has to be Christ-centered and Holy Spirit in power. This is not an organization that depends upon our administrative ability or our skills or our personalities or our charisma to grow. Unless the Lord builds it, those who labor, labor in vain. And the only way we're going to build this church is through the power of the Holy Spirit changing people, changing us, and changing our community. Because you can try to force yourself to be good and to do good, but it will fail, I promise you. But when the Holy Spirit comes into your life and begins to transform you from the inside out, all of a sudden you begin to desire things that before you thought were detestable. And you begin to detest things that before you thought were desirable. And that happens through a power of the Holy Spirit. I can't convince you. I can't make that happen. But when you submit to Jesus Christ and you invite the Holy Spirit, there is a transformation that takes place. And praise the Lord that He is faithful to do that. And so then there was a, a you, and I've spent a lot of time on this. There's not a lot of you words that fit here. Christ centered, Holy Spirit empowered. The only word that I could come up with was undefeated. And I don't mean, when I say undefeated, I, I was thinking about the passage of Scripture where it says that nothing can separate you from the love of Jesus Christ. Not not powers, not authorities, not principalities, nothing. And when the Bible refers to us as more than overcomers, that we were called to be more than overcomers, when I thought, think about the church, I think about a group of people who stand undefeated. That doesn't mean we have a perfect record. What it means is that the game's not over until Jesus returns, that we will not suffer being discouraged and being defeated because, A, Jesus has won already. The grave has no power over us. There is no victory over death, um, of, of death over us because Jesus has won that victory. This world has no power over us. 
that we've already won. We should begin to live a victorious way. We should begin to operate with a victorious mindset that we cannot be defeated. No weapon that's formed against us can prosper. This is an important mentality to have as a follower of Jesus. It's the, it's the, it's the mindset of victory. The, then there's an R. I said, I said, well, what does this mean? What is the church? And I begin to think about the redemptive purpose that we have in the world. You see, there's all kinds of disposable things that we have in our lives. We live in a disposable consumer mentality society. If something's broken, you throw it away, you get a new one. If something is just uh, is not useful anymore, you just move on to the next version. But I'm thankful for a God who looks at broken things and broken people and broken things in the world that are used up, washed up, no longer useful, and says, I have a purpose to redeem that for my purpose. God has called us as a church to be a people who are have this redemptive purpose and look at the world through those lenses of saying, I will not just look at what's broken and used up and washed up. I will see what potential they have if the Holy Spirit and the power of Jesus were applied to that situation and what could become of the situation by the redemptive work of God's grace. The church is redemptive. The church is compassionate. How powerful is Babe Grace? Amen. And her story. She just saw a video and she was started crying and said, I've got it, I'm compelled to do something. It is so easy for us to become uh, desensitized to the pain and suffering in the world. There's I can't fix it, there's nothing I can do about it, I can't make it go away. It doesn't matter how much I give. But this child teaches us something. That you may not be able to fix everything, but you can do something for someone. Even if it's a box of canned food, that becomes, through the power of God, a force that can bring God's kingdom into that place of darkness. I'm thankful that God would raise up a little girl to come tell us that today. That compassion is important. Caring is important. Don't let yourself become so callous that you forget to feel anything about the suffering that's going on all around us. Care for each other and for the world. And you may not be able to do everything, but you can do something. And when you take that step and let God use you, it's amazing how it can transform not just you, but the world. The last, there was another H, at two H's and two C's, and it was confusing. The last H in church. I just thought of home. I, I don't know what home means to you. The word. Probably for some people it's like, can't wait to get out of there. But I think there is something in all of our hearts that desires to be part of something that we call home, where we belong. And just like the early civilization of people was looking to create a a place that they could settle in. I think our hearts and our desire is to settle in a place with a group that we can belong with. And the difference between <clears throat> what happened in the Tower of Babel and what happened at Pentecost is that the kingdom that Jesus establishes and unifies us under is eternal. And I know that this world is not our home. But I believe that as we are part of a church, as one body, we get to begin to experience what home is like. To love each other in spite of our differences, in spite of our frustrations and failures. That we can create something that feels a little bit like home. My prayer for this church is that people would feel that. That when you walk in here, that you feel like you belong, that you're welcome. That you are loved. And that it's a place where you belong. And we're happy that you're part of it. You've got a lot of things to work on. And, and we will have that talk later. <laughs> but we all do. I want you to probably have to close your eyes.
stage in your life, the decisions that you have to make, and one of the decisions that you have to make is, are you going to be like the wise and the foolish builder? Are you going to build towers based on your own strength and ability and, and, and confidence? Or are you going to become part of God's kingdom on this earth? Are you going to build your life? Or are you going to be part of what God is building in this world, from this world, on His power and ability? My prayer is that this church becomes a church and part of God's witnessing community in this place, in Marysville, in this city, uh, for His glory. Uh, and this song is kind of about that.
know all of the things that are broken in our lives, in our minds, in our hearts. And God, I pray that you would begin to heal. Heal us. Make us whole again. Transform us into the men and women of God that you want us to be. God, empower us by your Holy Spirit to be the church here in this place for each other and for this community and for your glory. Jesus Christ, we pray that you would do this work in us. Anyway, God bless you all. Um, we'd like, uh, we're we're going to be here for a little conference here in a little bit, so uh, we'd like you to hang out for that.